Uh, I'm very sorry that you've been kept a little bit back from your tea. That is your high tea. As I, we were told earlier in the uh, the week it was called in this part of the world, as I as I well remember actually. Um, the reason for it, let me explain, is that uh, there has to, had to be a change in the restriction order. The reason for that uh, is that Mrs. Z is going to give evidence alongside Mr. Z. Uh, and uh, so those of you who are, have waited will actually see two witnesses, even though you very originally thought you were being offered one. But because the, the order is, is actually, it's a formal legal order which has serious consequences if it is broken, and so it has to be absolutely clear what it, what it says so that people know what they must not do and they can be held properly to account by the courts if they do what they shouldn't. Uh, it has to be properly written out. And because this was a late decision uh, to accommodate Mrs. Zed's evidence, uh, the restriction order has had to be changed formally, and that's taken uh, uh, just a, a short while. So I'm sorry about the delay, but you'll understand, I hope, why it's necessary. Uh, and it is also necessary that I therefore read out the order in what is its proper form. The press have been told and have got the order. Uh, I order that the names and address of witness W2223, that's Mr. Z to you and me, and witness W2311, Mrs. Z, and any other uh, identifying information, such as their images or a description of their appearance, cannot be disclosed or published in any form unless express permission is given by me or by the solicitor to the inquiry acting on my behalf. Witness W2223 and W2311 must be referred to only as Mr. Z and Mrs. Z. The order remains in force for the duration of the inquiry and at all times thereafter, unless otherwise ordered, and I may uh, vary or revoke the order by making a further order during the course of the inquiry. After that, may we have, please, Mr. and Mrs. Z. Mr. Z, your full name is known to the inquiry. Could you please take the book in your raised hand and repeat after me? I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Mrs. Z, your full name is known to the inquiry. Could you please take the book in your raised hand? and repeat after me. I swear by Almighty God I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth shall be the truth the whole truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth and nothing but the truth. And there is no live streaming or, no either audio. by video or, or by audio. Precisely, sir. And we've discussed that it's going to be too difficult for you uh, to refer to each other by anything other than your names. So those present in this room will hear your names and probably also the name of your daughter. But one, when it goes out on the live stream, those names will be removed and those present should not use the names outside of this room. Mr Z, you have severe haemophilia A. Yes. And you were diagnosed at 11 months old. That's correct. You had your first treatment in about 1972, 1973, yep. when you were about five or six. Yep. How frequently did you require treatment when you were young? Probably up until I was about five or six, I didn't need any treatment. Um, but after that, I was a regular receiver of cryoprecipitate and factor aid. It started off as cryoprecipitate. Started off as cryoprecipitate, yes. And then gradually it became factor eight. That's correct. 
when you were receiving those products, were, were your parents, or and latterly you, uh, were they ever warned about any risks involved in receiving them? No, I have asked my parents and they can't recall anything either. You're quite softly spoken, so would you mind okay. coming slightly closer to the microphone so that everyone can hear you? And did you tend to receive treatment when you needed it, or were you ever put on prophylaxis? No, um, I played a lot of football when I was young, uh, which sometimes necessitated bleeds, sometimes it didn't, and I got cryo-precipitate as and when required. In 1976, you were admitted into uh, the Royal Infirmary with infective hepatitis. Yes. Can you tell us about that occasion from what your parents have told you? Um, well, at the time we were told it was jaundice, um, turned yellow as you do. Uh, we were actually told it had been due to a, a dirty needle. I was put in solitary confinement in the city hospital, wasn't allowed out of the room, uh, and basically kept there for four or five weeks until I was better. But subsequently, it's been questioned whether that was. Uh, contracted through a from one of the factor products. Yeah, I mean, we did think at the time, how can you get a dirty needle? But that's what we were told at the time. In 1985, when you were about 18, you were told you had HIV. That's correct, yeah. What can you tell us about that appointment? Um, I remember it quite well. I could actually take you to the room in the ward where it was at um, and was told that. I was HIV positive. Um, certain things I couldn't do, you know, if I cut myself, I had to make sure it, it was cleaned up. Um, actually brushing my teeth as well, it can sometimes bleed your gums to be careful. Um, and other things as well, like having partners, etc. But when I was that age, all that meant anything to me was football. <laughs> Please, can we have a uh, document 2223009? Uh, it, it says this. This is simply to confirm that Mr. Z's HTLV3 antibody status is positive. Mr. Z himself knows this. I've not told his parents, as this is entirely between Mr. Z and them. I discussed the situation and some of the implications of this positive test with him when I told him the result. The immediate implication is simply that he's met this virus at some time in the past and has made antibodies to it. The fact that this test is positive does not, and it's underlined, mean that he has got AIDS. We know that a small but uncertain proportion of people with this positive antibody test do go on to develop AIDS in the future, but we cannot identify those who will. And if we pause there for a moment... Can you tell us how you felt about being told you were HIV positive? Well, what I remember at the time was that the television advert where it was a gravestone and I'm sure it said AIDS in the top of it and it was just falling over. And, and I mean, it was quite scary at the time and there was a, a huge stigma about it. But at the time, HIV, I thought HIV was AIDS, but obviously it, it's not. Um, so, yeah, they told me I was HIV positive, but I don't think I fully understood uh, what, it, what it meant. I just knew it was scary um, with all the television adverts and so on. And if we go back to the letter, a little bit further down, it says um, it discusses the risks of transmission. It says, however, the only way that this virus can be transmitted is by sexual activity, and I discussed this with him. Did that concern you at the time? Not at the time, but obviously later in life it, it would have uh, had some bearing. Um, but it was just a case of don't have family, that, that was it. There was nothing else at that time. Subsequently, if we just pause on the letter for a moment, subsequently, before you had your child, when you were older, when technology uh, uh, had moved on, were you ever advised about the possibility of sperm washing? We were, but that was after um, our daughter was born. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we would have probably have taken up the offer, if you see what I mean. But we weren't aware of it before, I know. You were never proactively informed no. about it until after you'd had your daughter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then returning to the letter, at the last paragraph, uh, it says this. 
in view of the unnecessary hysteria raised by the press about this subject, in which the infective risks were quite grossly exaggerated, I wouldn't propose that information about HTLV3 antibody positivity should be disseminated more widely than the patient, his GP, Dr Dawson and now, myself. Do you think we should redact Dr Dawson? No, sir, because it has been put to her. That's fine. Uh, and myself and any laboratory which requires to handle your patient's blood. How do you remember, again, in relation to what you were reading and who you were told you could tell about your HIV mm. status, how you felt about that at the time? At the time, I mean, obviously, I, I don't think my mother and father was told, so that was left to me, and of course I told them. Um, but no one, not even my sisters at the time, were told about it. That was just kept between mother and father and myself. Because as I say, there was a huge stigma at that time about it. And how did you feel about that, about not being able to tell people? Um, well, I wouldn't have wanted to because it, it really... I didn't want any sympathy. Uh, that's not the type of person I am. But uh, it was just better it was kept. We felt it was better to be kept between the three of us and other people as, they, as we saw fit. In 1987, in your records, there is a letter indicating that there was a meeting with you and, at that time, your girlfriend at that time. Uh, to discuss uh, the implications of HIV and haemophilia. Do you recall any such meeting? No, I first found that out when I met uh, the council a few weeks back, and I cannot recall that meeting ever taking place. I've got a very good memory. I remember most things, but that is just something I cannot recall. We're just going to have a look at the letter which appears to have been written uh, at around this time, it's 2223008. And if we look at the paragraph numbered one, it, it says this, the fact that all severe haemophiliac patients in Scotland should be regarded as having met the HIV virus at some stage in the past, regardless of any blood test. This is what was apparently advised at the time. Uh, current blood tests detect only antibody to HIV and cannot detect the virus itself. The exposure of haemophiliac patients to HIV has not necessarily been the result of imported factor VIII, and in fact Mr Z has never had anything other than Scottish factor VIII. Uh, do you have any reason to think that that part of the letter is incorrect, that you'd only ever received Scottish factor VIII? Well, I got the HIV virus from somewhere, so... That's all I can say. But you've got um, no reason to think you no. that you didn't re you received other other commercial products. No, not at all. No. As far as you're concerned, that's yep. right. You only yep. had Scottish product. Yeah, certainly wasn't told where it was coming from. No. And then, if we go to the very end of the letter, there's a handwritten note. Uh, X didn't ask the uh, Mr Z didn't ask the result of. Uh, Mr Z's HIV, sorry, uh, the, the, the lady who was apparently at the appointment didn't ask the uh, result of Mr Z's HIV antibody test. I didn't volunteer it as I thought she had enough to cope with. As you'll see uh, in one above, I've said that all haemophilia patients should probably uh, be taking similar precautions. Of course, when she asks, I will tell her this result. What's your reaction to that? Staggering. I mean, you would have needed my authority to disclose information like that. And we have already agreed to keep it to the three of us. So why we would tell somebody that I knew I wouldn't land up marrying? Why, why would I do that? You met your wife in about 1988. Yep. And you told her about your HIV. I did, yes. Can we have 2223012, please? It's a letter from the 8th of January 1992. <coughs> 
to your GP saying that you had got antibodies to hepatitis C. Were you told at that time? No, I wasn't. About the hepatitis C? No. And then if we can have 2223014, 7th of September 1995, the last paragraph indicates that your hepatitis phenotype, etc., had been checked. But obviously with his HIV, there would probably be little question of interferon. We will, however, keep him on our hep C positive register. At this point, were you told about your uh, hepatitis C? The first time I knew... Uh, no, certainly not there. I didn't know about the, the hepatitis C and certainly didn't know about any positive register. So from that, I, I take it you didn't consent to being put on a hep C positive register? No. Subsequently, have you been told anything about what the register is? No, nobody's ever actually told me. And then if we can go to 22230013... Twenty eighth of November nineteen ninety five. In the third line, it talks about your liver function test, and then the third line, he has, of course, positive hepatitis C. Were you told that your liver function tests had risen? No. And no. were you told at this point that you had hepatitis C? No. Two 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 three zero fifteen. August 1995, your hepatitis C phenotype is identified and it says uh, that uh, it's one for which interferon is satisfactory, which I understand means he would be suitable for interferon uh, therapy. Were you told then about the fact that you had hepatitis C? No, never told and never told of any, obviously treatment that there was. And what's your problem. concern about that reference to interferon treatment then? Well, that was 1995. Why did I not get it until 2005? As bad as it was, that's 10 years between mentioning it and actually giving it to me. Then if we go to 22230019... It's a letter from 1996 and it says that the implications of hepatitis C were discussed. We'll come back to that in one moment. Towards the end of the letter, it also discussed that you've agreed to undergo an endoscopy. Did you agree to go have an, uh, undergo an endoscopy? No. And did one happen? No. In 1996, was there any discussion about you having hepatitis C? in March 1996? Not to my knowledge, no. And why are you so clear that at that time you did not know you had hepatitis C? As I said, I had told my wife that I was HIV positive. Uh, when she fell pregnant, which would have been September 96, we obviously went to the hematology unit to get tested for HIV and to make sure that my daughter was OK. And we obviously didn't ask to be tested for hepatitis C at that time because we didn't, didn't know about it. Your wife was clear for the HIV. Yes, she was. But she'd also, you discovered later, she had actually also been tested for hepatitis C. Yes. And that was clear. Yes. But were you told she'd been tested for hepatitis C? No, we had no idea at the time and we just came across it um, when I had the liver transplant, we were looking through our medical notes and it came across the test results. At no time were we aware of hep C being tested for. You simply were told the HIV results, yes. mm -hmm. but nothing about the hepatitis C? No. So in 1996, you were still not aware that you had hepatitis C? No. When were you told? I can't quite recall um, when it was, um, early 2000s maybe, but it basically came, um, the new consultant was obviously looking after me and he happened to mention that I'm more concerned now about your hep C than your HIV. And I says, I don't have a 
clue what you're talking about. Can you please explain it to me? And that is the first I was aware of. I didn't even know what hepatitis C was at that time. In your statement, you've placed it around about 1997, 1998, but it would be at least the late 90s. Yes, yeah. I mean, I, ca I honestly can't recall the date, but um, yes, uh, it, it could be then, yes. Now, you've wanted to make clear that you have no criticisms of Dr Watson. No, absolutely none whatsoever. Um, and I must put on record that um, Mr Zed's statement has been provided to Dr Dawson, and she said she will be responding and that response will be published in due course. Going back to that point in time when you were told you had hepatitis C, what were you told then about it? I think very little. I think, to be fair to, to Dr Watson, if, if you were reading through my file and you were showing some of the letters there, he would have just assumed that I'd been told, but I hadn't. Um, I can't recall at the time, I mean, they were certainly given no leaflets or anything like that. It wasn't until later on that I discovered how serious this could be. And again, I can't give you a date because I, I don't know. Before you were told about your hepatitis C diagnosis, what was your physical health like? Um, I was six feet three, 14 and a half stone, muscly. Um, I wasn't quite the perfect specimen, but <laughs> I thought I was. <laughs> <clears throat> now, in terms of your HIV, you've been on treatment for it over the years with some AZT in, you yeah. think, about 1992, but with limited side effects. Yeah. Then since then, since about 2005, 2006, you've been on Coletra. Yeah. What side effects has the HIV medication caused for you? Very little. Um, in fact, I would hardly say uh, it, there hasn't been any. That's certainly noticed anyway. I mean, maybe medical tests will, will show something different, but... Uh, physically, mentally, it's had no effect on me. In terms of treatment for your hepatitis C, if we can yeah. have 22230.21, please. And if we look at the second paragraph, it's at March 2000. It says, today I've had a fairly frank discussion with him again about the role of antiviral therapy in his case. At the moment, I don't think there's any indication at all to change from AZT monotherapy to a combination treatment. Today, I've also discussed with him the potential for considering treatment of his hepatitis C with interferon and ribavirin. And then towards the end, through that paragraph, there's some concern about progression of HCV in the context of HIV. And at the end of the paragraph, when further studies of the use of combination therapy for HCV in the context of HIV therapy are published, then we could reconsider the situation with regards to his liver, which at the end of the day may prove to hold the key to his eventual outcomes. You were introduced to the idea in about 2000, that you may need some treatment for the hepatitis C. Mm -hmm. And then if we go to 22230.20, and we look, this is a letter from 2004, and we look at the second paragraph. Mm -hmm. uh, it says, I spent some time discussing with him the fact that there is now increasing evidence that the hepatitis C co-infection should be treated in patients with HIV. The hepatitis C is now the major cause of death in these patients who are co-infected. There have been uh, three large trials published recently which have revealed viral HCV clearance rate in the order of between 25 and 60 percent, depending on the genotype or the virus uh, encountered. Mr. Z, when last tested, had genotype 3A virus, which is one of the more favourable genotypes of treatment. I'd have to caution this, however, in that if he had cirrhosis as well as HIV infection, his chances of viral eradication would be much lower. I've made him aware of all of this. Rereading that, do you remember how you felt when you were told that news? Um, well, the positive I took from it is that genotype 3 was one that could be cured. Um, so that's what I basically held on to. Um, I can remember it. I can remember and telling side effects as well of what might happen. Um, but certainly I went away thinking, oh, well, genotype 3, I've got a good chance of survival. 
compared to where I was later on in life, 60% was a fairly high number. <clears throat> You started treatment for the hepatitis C in 2005 with pegylated interferon and ribavirin. Can you tell us what the effect of the treatment was on you? It was just horrendous. I, I wouldn't have wished that treatment on my worst enemy. Not that I have any. Um, so bad that uh, obviously I, I cleared the virus, but it came back. I don't think I would have done it again. And I remember sitting there, it was one Friday night, and we had this pen, I was ready to inject it into my stomach, and I thought, I've got no idea what this is going to do to me. Um, but we went ahead, and I had every single side effect. I had thinning of my hair, my hair, sore heads, tired all the time, couldn't sleep, itchiness in my skin, nosebleeds, Cramp. The worst thing was cramp. I was getting cramp in bits of my body. I didn't even know it was possible to have cramp in. And I do remember one day I had cramp in my fingers, my arms, legs, toes at the same time. And I was screaming in pain. There's not a cure for cramp. <laughs> and it was, it was just horrendous. I, I don't think I would have taken it again. You'd cleared the virus by about halfway through the treatment. Yep. Well, that's what the blood test seemed to be showing. Yep. Uh, but you had to stop the treatment after 37 weeks. Yes, that's correct. Why was that? I uh, basically fell seriously ill. My gullet, obviously the liver wasn't working and doing what it needed to do. Uh, and my gullet burst in various places and I started spe spewing blood. I uh, was rushed into Aberdeen. And that was on the 17th of December, 15th of December, 2005. And I don't remember much after that until Boxing Day. Mm -hmm. um, I was out of it and basically my wife had been prepared that the chances of survival was low. My organs were beginning to close down and my body was basically, I think the words they used were shutting down from the inside out. Yeah. I knew nothing about it. I, I remember going into hospital, um, but after you know, after that, I remember nothing until Boxing Day. Mrs. Z, can you tell us what yeah. it was like for you? I, will, <coughs> I had the ambulance journey in. It was a blue light journey in. I stupidly thought it was because there was lots of traffic on the road, but Jesus, as he said, it was having a baroseal bleed at that point. So they took him in, did investigation, did a brain scan because they were scared in case because of the haemophilia there was a bleed on the brain. Um, he basically, as I said, <coughs> fell asleep and didn't waken until Boxing Day. Um, we were prepared. The staff and the wards were amazing. The doctors were amazing, but I remember being taken in a relative's room and being told that maybe we needed to start thinking about other plans because his organs were shutting down from the inside out. So they would have a, a real look at the um, medicine that they had him on at that point and they changed everything and thankfully he started to turn a corner and pick up um, a bit. But it was it was horrendous. A little girl was just nine at that point, seven, seven at eight. that point. Um, so I couldn't even take her in to see our daddy because he was just, he was not Sorry. So he did pick up, thankfully, as I say, and he got home. Um, we had a long stay in hospital. It wasn't until February he got home. So got home, we had Christmas, but it wasn't long again until he landed back in hospital and that started the spiral to what, to what was to come. Before we talk about that spiral, um, after the treatment you were also diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. Yes. And that's now, you've still got it, it's controlled by yeah, insulin. Yeah, apparently, in, sorry, I forgot to say it. A side effect as well, I had a huge scab mm. on my stomach uh, where I was taking all the injections. That was quite unsightly. Mm. Um, sorry, I forgot your question. 
um, I was asking you about the type 2 diabetes. Yes. Um, later on, it transpired that I was told that a side effect of interfering is diabetes. Uh, so they did the tests, and yes, I am now diabetic and remain so. Can you tell us what happened? You got home, you turned a corner, you'd got home, but then everything went downhill. Can you tell us about that? It was just um, encephalopathy because your liver wasn't working to clean the toxins. Uh, basically, I would become unconscious, um, rushed into hospital. But th the worst thing, you know, I my daughter used to go to her bed. I was fine. And she'd wake up in the morning and I wasn't there. And it always seemed to happen at night. I don't know why. Um, and I could be speaking away like this and within two seconds, mm -hmm. that was me for anything up to a week, I think. Um, when I woke up, didn't know what day it was, what time it was. And this, this just happened periodically. Um, obviously, I used to get uh, ascites in my stomach. Mm -hmm. And I remember that the first time, was it 17 litres? of fluid they drained from my stomach, which I always put down to <laughs> eight bottles of two litre Coke. And when you're thinking it in that term, you think, oh, wow. <laughs> and I mean, it was just huge. Um, and it was painful, it got sore. And it came to the time that, yeah, the various escapades of encephalopathy, but every Sunday I used to go in and get my stomach drained, and that would have been 10, 12 litres every week. Mm -hmm. Life just was put on hold, it had to stop. You were put on the list for a liver transplant in June 2006. Yeah. And you got the call in February 2007. Yes. What can you tell us about that? It got to the stage that I just wanted the liver transplant. I mean, being a haemophiliac and having a huge operation like that, um, it's quite daunting. But I was just so ill, I had no quality of life. As I say, I went from a guy playing football, squash, badminton, and you name it, I did it sport-wise, to being in a wheelchair, not able to go to the toilet on my own. And my life, my life was just rubbish. <laughs> and I just wanted the transplant because that would have been the saviour for everything. <clears throat> and on the 1st of, uh, remind me the date, 1st of February? 1st of February. 1st of February. Um, I was taken down, got various tests, and because of the ascites, I think there was a question mark of whether I had an infection or not. And I thought, oh, great, we've come all this way down here. But luckily, it was clear, and I received my liver transplant. You've provided me with some photographs, and I've passed mm -hmm. them to the chair of you after your liver transplant. Yeah. Um, for obvious reasons, we won't put them up, but they mm -hmm. show you in a very different state yes. to the man we see now. Yep. After you'd had the transplant, you didn't particularly pick up, though, did you? What happened then? No, the, well, the first few days I felt great, um, but I just started that I couldn't breathe properly and just didn't feel as how I thought I was going to feel. I knew there was still something wrong, um, and that's when they discovered that... Uh, probably during the time of the interferon, um, remind me of the word, uh, septicemia. septicemia. I'd been attached to one of my heart valves and my heart was now failing. So you underwent a replacement of your aortic valve? Yes. In about April 2007? That's a, 26 April yes, 2007. Yes, 2007, that's correct, yeah. You remained in hospital almost continuously from February 2007 till July 2007. That's, mm -hmm. yeah. Can you tell us what the impact of that has been on your mental well-being? I'm a very positive person, and I think to get through what I got through, you had to be. Um, mentally, it's a case of, you know, I had a young daughter, she meant everything to me. And what kept me going was being able to walk her down the aisle. And I'm glad to say anything I will. Sorry. So um, 
that's the only thing I could think of that's what I focused on and luckily it got me through. Mrs Ed, can you tell us how it affected you throughout that time? It was, <coughs> it was so hard, so, so hard. Basically, I was in hospital in Edinburgh. Um, our daughter was at home in she would come down every weekend, but you didn't have a normal family life. You couldn't do normal things. We spent our ninth birthday in the canteen in the hospital, having our birthday there. Um, you just, as as says, life was on hold. You couldn't plan anything. You couldn't you couldn't think past that day. Um, and to see the person that you loved just be so helpless. He he could do basically nothing on his own. Um, and as he said, he'd gone from this big strapping person down to just a shadow. Um, and it was it was so tough, so tough to watch that and not be able to to do anything. He just felt helpless to to be able to try and sort that. The at the times of the operations, um at the, the liver transplant one, that was, you, you did feel almost a peace just that he was getting the operation, that the answer had come that we had prayed so long for. Um, but then he didn't recover as we thought he would. Um, and we got to the heart. And to get at that point, just before to the operation, we were, we were actually planning to take him home for palliative care because he was so poor. They told us that we should really enjoy the weekend with our family, because that's the stage that we were at. Thankfully, the surgeon agreed to do the operation, and when he came to speak to us about the operation, he said that we really had a less than 1% chance of coming through that operation. But at that stage, as Jim says, we went to tell her that Daddy might not be there much longer. but. We knew we would have tried absolutely everything, that there was no stone left unturned, that we could look at it and say, we've tried everything, we've done it. So we got to go down to the, the um, pre-op room with, with before that operation. And even at that point, he was thinking about us because we were standing at his bedside and he looked at us and he said, don't you worry. Whatever happens in this operation, I'm going to be okay. So we had that to hold on to. And thankfully, through prayer and, and so much amazing medical staff, he's, he's still here. We'll have him. And we're, we're thankful for that every single day. I think we should maybe say that uh, because of my poor state of health, the first two heart surgeons refused to do the operation that was required. And thankfully, the third surgeon said yes. And he said yes on the basis that I was young and had a young family, and he was prepared to give it a go. Um, otherwise, I wouldn't be here today. But at the time, we didn't really understand why two surgeons were saying no. But the normal heart operation is you, you get the cut down here and they break the rib and go in. I wouldn't have survived that. But the third surgeon um, pioneered a new method of doing the operation required. And I have a wee scar across my chest here, I don't know, maybe three inches. My heart was never on bypass. And thankfully, I'm still here today. What's the impact been on your daughter? Because throughout this time, she was living with her grandparents. Yeah. Coming down yeah. when she could. She, <coughs> she was amazing. She kept us going. But there was, as I say, that point, we had tried to protect her. We had tried to... We never lied to her. We never told her lies. But we maybe didn't they just put everything right in front of her. Um, but with the heart surgery, we, um, 
knew that we had to tell her. So I think that was the hardest, hardest night of our lives when we had to take, took her into that room and explain to her what was what was happening, that Daddy might not be here. She's been really strong. She absolutely adores her dad, just dotes on him. Um, and she's she's been our rock. She's kept it, kept us going. But she has been deprived to a certain extent of a normal family life because we didn't uh, for that two year period where she was basically in hospital all the time. We couldn't do anything as a family. As she says, he would she would go to bed. She would wake into an ambulance at the door, having to wave daddy goodbye in an ambulance, and so it. It's been really, really tough on her, but she's, she's done amazing. Mr Zed, you've said in your statement that um, it's very upsetting, and so you don't particularly talk about it at, at home. I, I, I don't talk about it. Uh, maybe my wife does, but uh, no. Well, it's gone, it's finished, it's in the past. You, you move forward. Mrs Zed, you stayed with Mr Zed uh, throughout and cared pretty continuously for him yeah. during that period and you decided to leave your job to be able to do that. I took a week, a, week, a year um, a year off work. Uh, I, st I had parental leave that I could use. I used that. I used, maxed out all my holidays, did everything and then I asked to take time unpaid. So, yes, that was what I did. And at that point you also applied for carer's allowance? Yes, can you tell us what happened? Well, we had been... So many people had said to us, it wasn't something that we thought about, but so many people had said to us, you should apply for a carer's allowance, she'll get it. So I went and got the forms, and I went down to the... I think it was... The, well, it was the Citizens Advice Bureau, completed the forms, had said everything, and the lady looked at them and said, you need to make the dark days darker. And I said, sir, if, if this is not enough, then I, I won't have your carers leave because I couldn't I couldn't make it any worse. I couldn't, uh, and I certainly wasn't going to get a lie on forms to get carers leave, so we didn't get it. Mr. Zed, you'd kept your hepatitis C diagnosis a secret until you became yeah. seriously unwell. Yes. Why was that? It's just the thing, you know. I can handle this in my own. Um, almost made it, but didn't quite. Um, and we just wanted to keep it within the family. Um, as I said, he was quite young, and again, Hep C was supposedly restricted to you know certain types of individuals. Uh, we didn't want my daughter to get hassle at school and, and stuff like that, so we just decided, right, we'll, we'll tell no one. Um, but obviously, when I fell ill, we we had to own up, shall we say. And you've still not told very many people about your HIV? No. Um, we've got friends here today, and I thought I'd better tell them before they come in. So my best pal has only found out about two years ago that I'm HIV positive. And, and again, what stopped you telling people? Again, just, just the stigma. I didn't want the sympathy of, oh, look at... Look at it's just not the type of person I am. So rather than just get on with life and... Survive. <clears throat> so you'd had to tell people because you got very unwell, you had the transplant, you had the heart operation. Mm -hmm. What was your physical health like from that point until about 2008? Well, as I said, um, during the, the 2005, when I was first admitted to hospital, um, I think I probably should have got physio in my legs because my right knee stuck in the fetal position. Um, so I was in a wheelchair or crutches. Eventually in 2009 got a right knee replacement. Um, but also because of the immobility I have arthritis in my left ankle now. And plus I still had to build myself up. Um, six feet three and five and a half stone just shouldn't, shouldn't be there. I shouldn't be here today. Um, but I was determined. I, I had a lot to live for. I had to learn to walk again. But we got there, just through perseverance and 
my positive attitude to things. 2008, you were told that the hepatitis C had returned. Yep. How did you feel when you were told that? I think we had a fairly good idea it was going to return it anyway, simply because I hadn't completed the full 48 weeks of treatment. Um, and it was kept under check. I mean, I can't complain about the NHS and the doctors, you know, from that point in. Um, they were great, kept a check in it. As I say, I don't think I would have taken interfering again. I just, there's just no way I could have put myself through that again. Um, not only because of that, because I, I was half the person I was as well, so I, I wouldn't have had the strength probably to to go through that again. But uh, luckily there was a, a new treatment came out, which I, I went on and successfully now uh, hep C negative. You had Harvoni treatment yes. in 2014. Yes. And what was that like? Um, compared to interferon, it was just night and day. Um, the only real side effect I had was um, no energy. Uh, apparently, I think, is it the white blood cells that can reduce? So I had very little energy, so continued to work full time throughout. How I managed that, I have no idea. Um, but it, it, it was difficult. I just had no energy to do anything. Um, so, you know, wasn't able to play sports or anything like that. And I mean, I probably wasn't strong enough at that time. Well, I might have been, but, you know, that, that was out of the question because I couldn't walk to the bottom of my driveway. And it's, it's not a long driveway without being out of breath, shut up. Um, no, it wasn't good health, but it was certainly better than the interfering. And can you tell us what your physical health is like now? Physical health now, it's probably as good as it's going to get. Um, my knee now, we just got confirmation from the consultant about a month ago. Um, due to various periods of inability, of being able to walk, etc., uh, there's a lot of scar tissue behind my patella. And I only have now 8% movement in my right knee. Um, I used to coach under 12s football and play football with them now, but I've had to stop back because it's just too difficult. Um, You'd actually returned to coaching the under-12s yes. just a few weeks after finishing the Harvoni treatment. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I love my football. Um, as I say, I played every sport, apart from rugby. That's the only sport I didn't play. Um, but had to give up the, the football coaching um, just in the last two, three months. But that's maybe an age thing as well, I don't know. <laughs> You've talked about keeping a positive attitude, a positive yes. mindset. Mm -hmm. Have you been able to do that since? You, you, you had to, yes. Um, I'm a very positive person. I had a goal. Um, I'll soon achieve that goal. That was a set of cards I'd been dealt with. Um, and you just had to get used to it and do the best you could. When we spoke earlier, you talked about the importance of your faith. Yes. Um, people use the word religious. I don't like that word. Um, we have a faith. And I believe I was in control of a higher authority than any doctor or consultant. Um, and prayer is a very powerful thing, and we certainly believe highly in it. When I was told I only had a few days to live, my wife texted everyone in her mobile to say, please pray for Jesus. And we found out that the, that text were being forwarded on to people in Russia, New Zealand, around the whole world. And if you've got the whole world praying for you, you've got a good chance of surviving. You've talked about work throughout this time uh, until August 2018. You've tried to keep working. Yeah. And, in fact, you returned to work within weeks of being discharged from hospital after your transplant. I had my heart operation on the 26th of April, and I was back at work in the end of July of 2007. But can you tell us a little bit about the impact all of this has had on your career? 
Yes, um, just before I fell ill, I was up for promotion. Um, applied for one job, we didn't get that one, but it was just a matter of time. I was being put forward by my bosses. But after that one attempt, I fell ill, so never ever got the opportunity to get promotion. When I did return in July, all the people that were below me were now either at the same level as me or higher. Um, and I, you know, obviously when I went back in 2007, 2008, that's when the whole world sort of collapsed. So I never ever got that promotion because the, the whole system was just flatlined. Um, so I never ever got that promotion. Although I got the title at the end of the day, I never got the financial reward for it. In August 2018, you were medically retired. Yeah. What happened? I was basically working 10, 12 hours a day, seven days a week. And I just felt I couldn't do it anymore. I wanted to be able to retire and enjoy it and do things rather than wait until something happens and retire and not be able to do anything. That's not really what I saw myself doing. I want to enjoy my retirement because I had worked 34 years and thought I deserved <laughs> something. <clears throat> but financially, your illnesses have had a significant yes. effect on um, you. It's just things like, you know, when you, you, you follow, I was in hostel for 364 days. And, you know, if you take loss of bonuses, um, car parking, my wife had to move to Edinburgh for seven months, um, never ever getting that promotion. Just simple things like that. Pension, you know, our, we, we, I was on a fixed uh, some pension and that was capped by the time, I, you know, so I, I didn't get the benefit of certain pension rights as well. And that's not just on one year, that's for the rest of my life. Um, and financially, it's, just, it's been a, a disaster. But we coped. We've got a we've got a superb family network um, on both sides, and we've survived, and we'll continue to survive. But it's had a huge financial implication. You applied for financial assistance from the McFarlane Trust. Yes. And at that time, you uh, have said in your statement that you had to sign something. Yes. What were your thoughts about that? What was it that you signed? Well, it was a disclaimer basically saying that I wouldn't take any action against the NHS. Um, now, when you're 17, 18, um, it's not, you know, you, you don't really understand what you're signing. Um, and there was a sum of money being dangled out there, so you just took it. Because at that time, you know, HIV was, was huge. You didn't know if you were going to be still alive the next day or two days after or, or what. Um, so I signed the disclaimer and put it off. And yes, I got the, the sum of money. You've also uh, had some financial assistance from the Skipton Fund. Yep. What are your views of that process? It was... I mean, the people before, you know, they've had difficulties. I, I basically filled in the form, gave it to my doctor, and it came back, and it was given. But I don't think you could have argued how I landed up, where I landed up. So, you know, whether we was asked to produce anything else, I mean, it was all relatively short, you know, term, it went away and it came back. Um, but it's the only way I could have had what I had was through infected blood. Those are the questions I have for you. Is there anything else you'd like to say? I think I would like to say this is, this is not about money. The NHS has been fantastic for me, but it also gave me a very, very deadly disease. Not once, not twice, but possibly a third time with the variant CGD. Um, so my wish is that someone just sits in front of me and says, we're sorry, it's our fault. We made a huge mistake and I'm sorry. And it will never, ever happen again. That's all I would want. Just someone to take ownership that somebody made a huge cock-up, for want of a better word, somewhere. And it shouldn't happen. Nobody should have to go through 
I always say I'm one of the lucky ones. I'm still here. There's hundreds not here. And that's why it's so important that this never happens again. I'm just going to turn and see if Mr O'Neill has anything he'd like me to raise with you. No, there's nothing further. I, uh, I feel very glad that you will be here in August, at the end of August. Thank you. Um, your resilience is amazing. And thank you for being here, both of you, um, to give the evidence that you, you have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ten o'clock tomorrow. Thank you, sir.